Hello, and welcome to the Plumes of Oz, where we want to look at Australian birds in the wild. Look at this beauty. White eyebrow, brown body, yellow eye, curved bill, strong legs, feeding off the ground. This bird is called a grey crowned babbler, and today we want to look at the Australian babblers. Hear that woof in the background? Woof! is the sound of the grey crowned babbler. Now this one drinking has a dark eye, so it's an immature bird. If it had a yellow iris, it would be an adult bird. Babblers are found in Australia, Asia, Europe. But there are many different forms of babblers, and babblers of different countries aren't all of the same genera. But the common thing about babblers is that they all make this beautiful melodic babbling sound as they forage. The Australian family of babblers is called Pomatostomidae and the genera Pomatostomus. This genera is exclusive for the Australian babblers and within this genera we have four species of babbler. And the grey crown is the most common and largest of these birds. A grey crowned babbler eating a small caterpillar, their choice of food. Though they are insectivorous, they really do like larval forms. The entomology of the genus name Pomatostomus is confusing. It has Greek origins, poma, for, hidden or lid, and stomus, like stomata, or opening. And the nostril of these birds is very high on the bill, just about, hidden, or covered. Babblers are group birds. Even throughout the world where the term babbler is used to describe a bird, these are group birds. Most groups that I have seen are between 6 and 10 birds, occasionally going up to 12. A typical group of 8 babblers in a cypress pine. Did you get that change from the babble to the yahoo, yahoo? It is said that the female gives the ya and the male the hoo, giving this duet effect or antiphonal duet, as though the song comes from a single bird. Listen to this call. I can't tell if this is a male or a female, but it's a yah call. Listen. And the interesting thing is how the other birds copy this call. I suspect that this is a dominant bird within the group. Babblers are passerine birds with anisodactylic feet, three toes pointing forwards and one backwards. And like many other passerine birds, when on the ground, babblers don't walk, but hop. This is in contrast to many of the parrots that have zygodactylic feet. And the parrot walks with bipedal walking motion. The Australian babblers are defined largely by the eyebrow or supercilium. And in the grey crown babbler, the supercilium is white and very wide, extending over the scalp, leaving only that grey line on the crown. After ground feeding, the next commonest site of feeding for the babblers is on the bark of trees. And here this grey crown babbler becomes a little apprehensive. He fans his tail. Look at the beautiful white tips on the retrices. The reason why he's apprehensive is that butcher bird. Butcher birds will often watch groups of birds that feed together. When the babblers catch a meal, the butcher bird swoops and startles. The babbler drops the catch and the butcher bird gets an easy meal. Well, the butcher bird missed out on a meal then, but he keeps an eye on this babbler. This one is collecting nesting material. The grey butcher bird observes, hoping he can follow the babbler back to the nest. For the butcher bird is a nest predator. Well, the babblers play a few of their own tricks on the butcher bird, swooping on it, trying to distract it. But the butcher bird persists in its attempt to get the babbler into flight so it can follow it. But the babbler collecting the nesting material is aware of all these tricks of the butcher bird and just keeps persevering while the other group babblers do their thing in distracting it. And in the end, the babbler got back to the nesting site without being followed by the butcher bird.
Again, the grey crown babbler feeding. Look at the strength in that bill as it probes into the soil. The tip of the bill is hidden, and perhaps this is one reason why it can be called pomatostomus. Not hidden nostril, but hidden mouth. Well, we've seen several of the babblers picking up nesting material, and this is where they're bringing it. It's in a cypress pine, and the birds are only bringing nesting material, no food. So this structure is not really a nest, but more of a roosting site, where the birds huddle on a cold night. Let's follow some more babblers collecting nesting material. These babblers are in a magpie's territory. And the magpie is not too keen. He's collecting his own nesting material. But the magpie is not a nest predator. So these grey crown babblers have an uninhibited flight back to the nest. Now, I believe this is an active nest. Though the birds did take nesting material in, I have seen two birds carrying in food. The first bird carrying food in had a yellow eye or an adult. The second bird had a dark eye. And watch as we find another bird taking in a butterfly. This also has a dark eye. An immature helper bird. The group structure of babblers is poorly understood. In a large group, for instance 12 birds, there may be two breeding pairs, but mostly the group only has a single breeding pair. Personally, I have never seen more than four yellow-eyed birds in a group. Most of the group seems to be immature birds with a darker eye. So if there are four birds with yellow eyes in a group, that is four adult birds, does this imply two breeding pairs? Of this I am very uncertain. And the implication then is that all the darker-eyed birds that are in the group are just immature helpers or slave labour. Sometimes one can find a group of babblers like this sitting up in a tree. There is no white-eyed babblers here. They are all dark-eyed. So this is a bit like a crèche where they are waiting for mum and dad to come and take them down onto the ground to help them to learn how to feed and look under the bark of trees to find the arachnids. Whatever the babblers do, they tend to do as a group, whether it be feeding, teaching the young, or having a drink. Here you can see two babblers, three babblers, and indeed there were six, but they do tend to spread out a little bit when they're feeding. Occasionally one can get them side by side, but this, as shown here, is the more typical appearance of babblers foraging on the ground. Again, behaving a little bit like a woodpecker, digging under the bark, hoping to find that tasty arachnid. A catch at last. There are several birds in Australia that work in groups. The babblers is the most prominent. After this, the apostle birds and the white-winged chuffs have very similar behaviour pattern, feeding off the ground, digging into the ground, looking for insects. Here on the northern tablelands of New South Wales, I was in a hide photographing at this water point and there was a group of eight babblers that came down. If you look at the eyes of these birds, you'll see 
that three of the birds have yellow eyes and the rest have dark eyes. Now I didn't quite get every bird in the video. This gives us an idea about the nature of the group. There is at least one adult breeding pair, possibly other adults assisting, and then the majority of younger birds that work as helpers in the construction of the nest and feeding of the young. Some people believe that the parrots are the most intelligent birds because they can talk. Others believe that birds that display group activity of play, tumble, turn, scratch my back, are the far more intelligent group because they learn from one another and have a combined group intelligence. And here you can see the grey crowned babblers in their mode of play. Again in the Northern Tablelands on another occasion, I was lucky enough to have this group of babblers come in overhead. It seemed to be a divided group, but listen to the chatter as one half of the group talks to the other half. And here there are two yellow-eyed birds. As they babble, look at the throat. There is enormous movement, and this relates to getting the sound out of the syrinx. The babbling increases as the group unite. Look at that throat movement. The syrinx is really active in making song, or perhaps I should say babble. Associated with the song is the movement of the wings and the tail and the head, the movements of excitement. I mentioned the syrinx and vocalisation. When it comes to paleoavian development, the syrinx is one of the things that is most difficult to explain. In the 1980s, Archaeopteryx was thought to be the link between reptiles and flight. As a molecular biologist, I look at Archaeopteryx and find little that correlates to birds. The reptilian tail to me is reptilian, and keratin is a molecule that has many forms, whether it be fur, skin, feathers or scales, it is still keratin. Archaeopteryx is a feathered dinosaur without a syrinx. But the phylogenetic concept of birds coming from reptiles was founded on the clavicles or the collarbones and the hollow bones that work as air sacs. In both birds and dinosaurs, the clavicle is fused and called the furcula. Or at Christmas dinner, we may call it the wishbone. Dinosaurs and reptilian creatures do not have a syrinx. Crocodilus has what is described as a syrinx, but it is far removed from an avian syrinx. So the development of avian song is still a very interesting topic. In Yaming, in China, in the last decade there have been some fascinating paleontological findings, such as Archaeornithura having the features that define birds today, and being found in the same fossil layers. It is a bird that existed with the dinosaurs in the Cretaceous period. But at the end of the Cretaceous period, dinosaurs became extinct, trapped in ash and drowning mud to be fossilized, but birds flourished. So the fact that birds have a wishbone, hollow bones, legs, similar to reptiles, has little bearing on the theory that birds came from reptiles, for they coexisted at the same time. And we still don't know the answer, but I do believe that there is a concept of intelligent design in the birds. Here at this waterhole photographing, most of the babblers had dark eyes. Some had maybe a hint of yellow, but no real pale yellow eyes. So what happens to the adults? I suspect that this is purely a social response of the younger birds. And being very playful birds, they are more likely as younger birds to have a bath. So this is a form of socialization. Another group of young babblers, all with dark eyes again, no adults, socialising at a roosting site, waiting for the adults to show them how to go and feed on the ground. Here we have headed north up to Cloncurry in central Queensland and these babblers are feeding and collecting material for a nest. Both yellow-eyed and dark-eyed birds are collecting the nesting material. So the adult breeding pair is being assisted by the helpers. Sometimes I don't know where the nests are, but if you watch the bird as it flies up into the canopy with a mouth full of feathers and grass, you can often find that it will lead you to the nest. And on this occasion, you can see that this nest is extremely large and this is often the way with babblers. 
Some of you may be able to tell if this is a brood nest or a breeding nest. I personally cannot tell the difference, but being large, some people have told me that they suspect it is a brood nest. Moving further from Tuncurry towards the west, we come into the Kimberley, and here again are the grey crowned babblers, but they are different. They have a beautiful rufous colour going down onto the chest. Once considered to be a separate species, they are now a subspecies of the grey crowned babbler called Rubiculus. Their behaviour is exactly the same, feeding off the ground and also gleaning off the trees. Underneath this ghost gum, I was amazed to hear babblers calling. Most babblers go in the lower canopy and on the ground, but here in the Kimberley, approximately 12 metres from the ground, this rufous northern grey crown babbler group was actively going in and out of a tree hole. Now I've never seen them using a hole like this as a nest, so it's a place where I'd like to have had a little bit more time. They didn't carry any food or nesting material in and out of the hole, and overall I suspect it was just a play activity time. As the birds emerge from the cavity in the ghost gum, you can see the beautiful rufous colouring going from the breast up onto the throat. another babbler. But on this occasion, this babbler doesn't have a grey crown. Look, the dark brown of the back extends right up over the cap, and the white supercilium or eyebrow is well demarcated by the contrast. And this bird is called the white-browed babbler. So this is a new species compared to the grey crowned babbler, but they have very similar attributes. They forage under bark, they have a slightly higher pitched call, Hear that? Instead of a wolf, it's a whip, whip, whip. And please ignore the grey shrike thrush calling. The white browed babbler has a dark eye, no yellow at all. In fact, it's only the grey crowned adult babbler that has any yellow of the iris that's visible. All the other babblers in Australia have dark eyes.
Another group of babblers perched up in a tree, but look at those white marks going down over the wing. Corporal stripes, two white marks, and here they are, now on the ground. You can still see those white marks, but there is something else about these birds. It's a little bit blurry and hard to see, but these birds have a chestnut crown, and they are called the chestnut crown babbler. These are a little bit far away, but you can still see the reddish glow to the top of the head. So this is another species of babbler. The family name for the Australian babblers is Pomatostomidae. This genus name Pomatostoma, as I mentioned, can have several meanings. Pomato for hidden or lid, and stoma for opening. Possibly it could be mouth, not nostril. For when the babblers feed, often the bill is hidden under the surface of the earth. Using the vibrosensory organ at the tip of the bill, they dig detecting movement of any larval or insect forms hidden in the surface soil. Here again the chestnut crown babbler foraging. They are beautiful little birds and probably my pick in terms of the beauty of the babblers. Now for our last Australian babbler, you may think this is a white-browed babbler, but it is darker, and the white brow is separated in the centre by a dark ridge, not a grey ridge, but a dark ridge, and this bird is called Hall's babbler, named after Major Harold Wesley Hall, who in 1960 was asked by the British Museum to collect specimens of the Australian birds for the museum. He was a philanthropist who paid and organised for these trips. And on one trip, a new babbler was collected from southwest Queensland. Hence, this bird received the name of Harold Hall and is today called Hall's Babbler. This concludes our video on the Australian babblers. We hope you've enjoyed it. If so, please hit the subscribe button and you will get notified of our next release of Australian Birds in the Wild by Plumes of Oz.